Hello and welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's your host, Justin Nielsen, along with Arusha Paris, who joins me every week. He's an O'Neill Global Advisors Portfolio Manager. How are you doing today, Arusha? I'm, I'm doing well, Justin. Great to be here. Yeah, great to have you as always. And I'm really excited about our guest this week. Yep. Uh, I think I was kind of showing that excitement last week when I was uh, talking about it. It's Tom Sosnoff. Now, Tom Sosnoff is the CEO and founder of Tasty Live. You might also recognize him from tons of videos that he did with Tasty Trade uh, before you know selling that company, but he's still involved with that. Also, co-founder uh, and creator of Think or Swim, which I personally use all the time. Um, you know, gosh, a, a serial entrepreneur, basically. Uh, welcome to the show, Tom. How are you doing? Ah, awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I got to say, um, when I was, you know, and this, this was about 10 years ago, I, you know, had been so focused on stocks, and I really wanted to get into uh, understanding options a little bit more. Uh, your your videos were invaluable. Uh, I, I think, you know, just the, the way you approach things. Now, granted, it was very different uh, from what I was used to. Uh, your your approach to risk management, um, you know, kind of trade often, <laughs> you know, tra trade small, trade often. Um, you know, I mean, how many how many trades do you do typically in a day? Um, over, I do. Uh, uh, it, it varies, but I would say on average, you know, somewhere between seventy five and one hundred. I, I do yeah. about probably fifteen, sixteen thousand a year. It comes out to something like that. Jeez. As a retail customer, yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah, hopefully someone else is having to keep track of all that for uh, for tax purposes. Uh, sure. But um, yeah, so one of the things again that kind of struck me as being so different from our style is your your approach to risk. So maybe you know just so people can kind of get a little bit of an understanding of you know th that approach. I mean, you look at. Uh, I, again, I was always afraid of the the naked, you know, the naked calls and and things like that because of that unlimited risk. You know, unlimited yeah. risk just doesn't sound fun at all to me. Um, but you kind of approach that with a uh, with kind of a nod, a smile, and you know, not not too bothered by it. How how do you do that exactly? Well, it, first of all, it's taken a long time. It didn't start out that way. So, okay. um, you know, with, with a few, with, with a lot of trades in a lifetime of many decades of doing this, you know, it's, um, I, I think it, to a certain extent, it becomes second nature. But what we've learned in the last 12 years, like, like Tasty is a think tank. Tasty mm -hmm. Trades is a brokerage, but Tasty Live now is our think tank. And what we've been doing is so much crazy research over the last, you know, we're like a quantitative probabilistic firm. We're, we're very statistical and math driven on everything. We found out over the years through through a, just a nutty amount of research was that the most effective um, uh, kind of risk prevention or risk aversion would be just staying small. Like like we always used to think as a, I started off my career as a floor trader. As a floor trader, it was always like kind of go big or go home type thing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was all just, you know, you know, which you know, it was, it was just a game of egos and, and big bodies and lots of egos. But <laughs> as we became retail investors, I, I, I really kind of learned how to trade. And it's, it's about staying small because the only way you can truly defend yourself, is just keep your position size small. Mm -hmm. It takes all the, it takes all the crazy outlier risk out of the equation. It takes, it takes all the fear out of it, out of trading. So just staying small, you can kind of defend almost anything you do. And that's how essentially that's that's essentially the methodology we use. Mm -hmm. How many positions do you generally have at a time, Tom? Well, remember, I, I do a bunch of stuff like like I do a live show all the time and I'm always yeah. trading. But and 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 now with today's technology, I, I'm indifferent to product. It's a big part of me. Like I don't care if it's if it's futures, if it's futures options, if it's indexes, index options, ETFs, whatever it is. But generally throughout the course of the year, I average between now, this is not positions. This is underlyings. About okay. eighty under about eighty underlyings, probably a okay. few hundred positions, but eighty underlyings. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Like like in Tesla, I might have yep. five or six positions. In Spy, I might have five or six positions. Okay, that but makes in some sense. other yeah. stock, I may have one. You know that kind of okay. thing. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that kind of, I guess, turns people off with you know. Okay, you you have your small position size, yeah, so sure. that's great. You know, you're not yeah. having you know too much risk, and sure. uh, it's a little bit easier to stomach. But then a lot of people say, "Well, gosh, I I I killed it on this one. 
but my position size was so small, I barely made any money. So yeah. uh, how do you counter that argument? Uh, that's a high class problem. <laughs> the, the other side to that is way worse oh my god yeah. i traded too big i don't have any money left yeah <laughs> oh, yeah that's um, true that's, that's, true. that's a way worse situation you know uh -huh. like i hope that every single person uh bitches and moans to me that they traded too small so they didn't make enough money right. like that, that's that's every you know that, that that's every money manager's dream that's every that's every trader's dream um listen i understand that everybody wants to get rich overnight and everybody wants to make a killing on everything they do. But the reality of trading and being a self-directed investor, it's about, it's about scalability, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's about longevity and it's mm -hmm. about repeatability. You know, yeah. I, I do this, I do a lot of live lectures and one of the lectures I do is, is all about the difference between success and failure is longevity. Mm -hmm. And as yeah. crazy as that sounds, yeah. The longer you can, the longer you can stay doing what you love doing, and the longer you can stay participating, obviously the better you get. But that's also the difference between, for most people, between success and failure. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, just, and we talked about that a lot of times. You know, hey, just just staying in the game. You know, yeah. and, and that's success why we... is success is really marginal in in almost. And I'm not talking about just trading. Success in business and entrepreneurship in life in in even if you're working for a large corp company, whatever it is, the the difference between um, success and different levels of success is so marginal. It's it's almost like think about it like a a hitter in baseball. The difference mm -hmm. between hitting, you know, 320 or 315 and 280 is a couple of bloop singles. Yeah. And that's like such yeah. a marginal um, amount of, of difference. You know, just you get lucky where the ball lands, things like that. But that's the same thing in business. It's the same thing in trading. The difference is, is marginal and it's all based on longevity. Mm -hmm. well, what's one of the biggest mistakes you made? trading early on like as a retail trader that that you know was a oh, big mistake yeah. you had to learn or even as a floor trader when you were oh, first yeah. starting out yeah every every there's only one mistake that every because markets today are really efficient so assuming that you mm -hmm. stay in liquid underlyings the biggest mistake that everybody makes there's no like dispute there's no like you can't say i did i i shouldn't have done this or i should have done whatever it is because markets are efficient the biggest mistake people make is size they trade too big yeah. They just they put all their eggs in one basket. They're not they're core. They're all correlated to a single underlying. They take all the risk on the same thing because they think they know something. And so the biggest risk, every single person I we have had millions of customers over the years. And the biggest risk that anybody takes is just size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of correlations, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the current market, because okay. we have. Uh, you know, the NASDAQ composite just just roaring right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are like, oh, look, I'm I'm diversified. I'm in I'm in Microsoft. I'm in Meta. I'm you know, and it's like, well, you're you're in tech or you're playing the AI uh, thing. And, you know, certainly with the NASDAQ composite, uh, we've talked a lot about how it really, you know, the power of the index for a for a while there was really re regulated to what we were calling the magnificent seven, you know, seven stocks that were basically doing all the heavy lifting. So when, when you've got, when you've got things correlated like that, um, what does your approach change at all to kind of get yourself that diversification a little bit um, so that you're not making too big of a bet in certain areas um, yeah, or how it, does market timing play into any of this? Well, well, it's not market timing, but it's a great, it's, it's, it's a great topic because this is very confusing, especially for most retail investors. The concept of correlation versus non-correlation is, is almost something that's, that's almost, it's taboo. It's almost not talked about. But the reality is if you're in Microsoft and you're in Google and you're in any one of these big seven stocks, you're in Netflix, Netflix or Meta or, or, um, or Amazon or, or Tesla, whatever, you know, what, whatever it is, or Apple, the same, you know, the same seven stocks, or mm -hmm. it could be the same 25 stocks. If you're in AI and whatever else, if you throw Nvidia in there and everything else, you're essentially not correlated at all. And right. your risk is, those are all going to act almost the same. Correlation is interesting. Correlation goes from a negative one to a positive one. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a bunch of NASDAQ stocks like that, you are very close to 0.8. You're somewhere between 0.75 and 1. And that mm -hmm. means everything you have is highly correlated. In a perfect non-correlated portfolio, you'd be wrapped around zero. 
Right. And then it inversely correlated would be something like the S and P's and the VIX. Those are inversely correlated. But when you're in all tech stocks, you're going to be so highly correlated. And the problem with that is that when you're non-correlated, you reduce your portfolio risk by almost 30 to 35 percent. That means that means portfolio volatility, your volatility of your PL, and mm -hmm. you're just your portfolio volatility in general, just your just how much how much PL risk you have. When you are non-correlated, it's just it's so much smoother and your swings are so much lower. And people go, well, I don't know how to get non-correlated. And it is challenging. And if you've never really looked at it or studied it before, it's a challenge. It's hard to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to add like a bond position. It could be in derivatives, but I'm going to add a currency position or I'm going to add um, a gold position because those are all not correlated to the NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. They have either a negative correlation or a zero correlation. And those bring down your portfolio volatility. You can even add digital assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum to that. And those bring down your portfolio correlation dramatically from the NASDAQ stocks. Mm -hmm. So do you have any suggestions for how people can go about that non-correlation? How, yeah, it, how they can strive to do it? It's it's a challenge, but all correlations, most, most platforms in, in 2023 mm -hmm. have non-correlated basically have all the correlations posted on the platform and what the correlation is to the S and P 500. So mm -hmm. you can essentially, they don't, they, they won't show you the correlations necessarily from, from um, Apple to NVIDIA, but they will show you the correlations from Apple to, to S and P's and from NVIDIA to S and P. So you can see all the natural correlations and you can figure out, you know, how do I become non-correlated or you can do it the simple, the, the simple way you can find certain stocks like they might be in the Dow. Like for example, you might look at Disney here and say, you know what, Disney's been beaten up. It's a, it's, it's not acting very well. But the difference is it's not correlated. So if mm -hmm. I bought Disney here against, let's say, Nvidia or AI or Microsoft or something, you're doing something that's that's actually a lot more intelligent than just buying Disney because it's down. You're actually mm -hmm. making your portfolio non-correlated, and you can do simple things like that. You can decide, hey, you know what. Gold hasn't gone anywhere, so I'll buy a couple of gold stocks or I'll buy something else, you know, some other commodity or bonds or whatever else it is, just because even though you might not love them and might not have the same excitement as you would have in buying Microsoft or Apple here because you want that NASDAQ, you know, those that high NASDAQ, that high NASDAQ beta, you you are diversifying your portfolio by getting non-correlated by doing that. Mm hmm. Right. So what? Uh, so uh, Tom, what? Because what, there, there are a lot of moving parts there, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so that, especially that's, for that's heavy. Just trust me. Yes. I know. That's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got. Yeah, it. because and you and you've been teaching a lot of people for many many years. Yeah. How do you get people, especially who are new to this? How do you get them past kind of that first hurdle where because it's it's out of fear initially, right? You you know what you know what we do, and I can't speak for everybody because like everybody, you guys have your own style. Everybody has their own style, but and 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 you know like like you, I I don't consider myself um, somebody that does investor education. I I consider myself somebody that that has investor content. You know, I'm a content creator, and I mm -hmm. I I love education, but it's not it's 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 not as scalable as, as content is. So what we do, and this is a very different approach. But I think you'll appreciate it. What we do is we challenge people because what we found is that most people who want to manage their own money, regardless of what language they speak, regardless of where they are in the world, regardless of where they have their brokerage account or whatever it is, people, smart people love to be challenged. Hmm. And so if you don't dub, dumb stuff down and you give them a logical kind of kind of, in our case, a mathematical approach to things, we find that we attract a certain kind of of viewer and a certain kind of customer that's like whether they're engineers or they're pilots or they're mm -hmm. you know policemen i don't care um they love to be challenged by the the logic part of it so we try to do it via challenge each mm -hmm. person does it differently but like we're having this conversation here today people go oh that's interesting i'm challenged by it. i want to learn more yes mm -hmm. So you talk about, you know, people, and again, this is true, people all over the world, you know, tuning into your content. Yeah. And you also talked about the correlation part. What about the international side? You know, uh, there, there, there's also, we get so U.S. focused, you know, raw, raw yeah. USA. Um, yeah. You know, there, there's that correlation too. Do you, yeah. do you go into international and, you know, I, hey, I do. There, 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 I don't trade. So, so it's a little, I'm a little weird that way. So 
first of all, like everybody else in America, we're all ethnocentric. We all mm -hmm. think that the world, as far as the world of investing ends on both coasts, you know, there's nowhere else in the world that's really relevant. But um, that's just the way our minds work because we have the most liquid, most efficient marketplaces. Mm -hmm. um, I don't trade in other countries um, simply because of a bunch of reasons. The data is hard to get. The clearing's hard to do. The, the currency conversion's a pain in the neck. There's all these reasons, timing, things like that. But I do trade a lot of either sector ETFs from other countries, or I will trade individual stocks. Like I, I would say this year we've probably traded like more Chinese stocks okay. that are, they're listed in the U.S., but they're mm -hmm. Chinese stocks. Like, for example, Baba or Baidu or, right. you know, FXI or, you know, PDD. There's just, or JD. You know, there's a lot of very liquid stocks that are mm -hmm. listed, you know, from listed in the U.S. from other countries that we do find interesting. Um, mm -hmm. And we're a publicly traded company in, in London, and I don't even trade on the FTSE. We're a FTSE, you know, company. So, <laughs> right. um, so you know, just, just because of the complexity, U.S. brokerages will support, you know, anything that, basically anything that trades in the US. So I do trade lots of other places, but I don't consider that it's there's some diversification in trading, like for example, Chinese stocks or we're trading some, you know, a Brazilian ETF or a Taiwanese ETF or an Indian ETF, that kind of stuff. But there's it's not as it's not as great as you would think. It's still equities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so like to when, when finding some Chinese ETFs so, or deciding, okay, you know, I want to get some allocation yeah. e Chinese ETFs. Are you looking at that more from a valuation perspective or are you using the kind of that correlation? Like, hey, maybe we're, this is a little bit, you know, less. We're using we're else. using both correlation and price. So so we're okay. not we don't we don't do that. I mean, listen, we're a little different. Um, we don't do things based on fundamentals or technicals, but we mm -hmm. do have opinions. We are very opinionated and we will form opinions based on a very subjective view of price extreme, which means yeah. Yeah. your version of your your idea of price extreme may be different than mine, but right. we're going to get to fairly close to the same place. I mean, I'd have a hard time arguing right now that, for example, you know, NVIDIA is underpriced. <laughs> you know, I'd, <laughs> I'd have a hard time arguing that like Target is overpriced. You know, so there, you, it may not be at its bottom, but, you know, there's certain things that we can all agree on. It's just subjective at, at what level is is cheap or is extremely cheap or extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot more for us to get into. So uh, we're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the strategies that you use and dive into a little bit more of this technical versus fundamental versus what else is there. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. With inflation, interest rates, and the recent banking crisis, are you nervous about what's coming in the stock market? If you're ready to take control of your trading and forecast trends instead of reacting to them, then Vantage Point's artificial intelligence is for you. Did you know Vantage Point's AI predicted the trends of all the collapsing banks weeks in advance? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com to learn how you can predict trends with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. He is a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And on the show this week, we've got Tom Sosnoff. He is CEO and founder of Tasty Live, uh, creating all sorts of content, really, you know, focused on options, but I mean, gosh, everything. But Tom, I just want to kind of jump back a little bit because uh, we were talking about, you know, some of the analysis. You're talking about whether something is overvalued or undervalued, uh, which sounds fundamental. You know, we we like to talk a lot about fundamentals and charts, you know, on the technical side. And I always thought, well, you're either technical, or you're fundamental. And you kind of say uh, none of the above. What what are you exactly? Well, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, in 2023, I don't know if you're allowed to ask that. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. um, I grew up in this business on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, the SIBO. Mm -hmm. And I, I was down there for just about 20 years as a market maker. And in the trading pits, there were um, obviously, you know, back then there was it was all open outcry. So there was no room. It was just, you know, four or five hundred people standing sideways so you could fit. And there was no such thing as news, charts, fundamental. It was just everything was based off order flow. Mm -hmm. and, and and I know that sounds weird to people, but but essentially you get a feel for the markets based on noise. Mm 
Yeah. And and it becomes a little bit of second nature. So so that was the first 20 years of my career. I didn't even I never even saw a chart for 20 years. I never even read anything. I just basically about fundamentals because we traded index products. So mm -hmm. when I got off the floor and we built Thinkorswim in 1999, 2000, um, all of a sudden when we launched the product, all people kept doing is writing to us and saying, how come you guys don't have charts? And we're like, do people actually, I swear to God, it's the real story. <laughs> we're like, do people actually look at charts? We had no idea. And Thinkorswim became one of the most popular platforms in the world. Yeah. And when we first launched it, we didn't even have charts. Ah, and so we're like, amazing. we're like, and people just kept writing to us. They go, how could you launch a platform without charts? And we were look, we all looked at each other. We're like, because we all came from the floor. We're all friends. And we're like, these guys, these customers want charts. And we're like, why do they want charts? We couldn't figure it out. We had no news and no charts. And, 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 that's, and that's where it started. And then we were like, okay, well, we'll build charts. We built like one of the best charting platforms in the world after that. Yeah. But but you know, it took us like two years to build. You know, amazing. Mul we built multiple charting platforms, um, and you know, because customers want it. We to this day, we still can't figure out why customers want charts. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about how you use the volume because I think in in many ways it is similar to the way we use the like, charts. We're just kind of like, a lot of times getting kind of the sentiment, the feel of what the yeah. how the market's reacting and things. But talk talk a, a more about how when you're on the when you're on the floor. How you use the the noise to kind of well, get well, engaged? Well, on well, floor traders, and traditionally, this is everywhere, all over the world. Like everybody was always attracted to noise because where there's noise, there's money. Yeah. The whole thing in this in the trading business is where there's where there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of activity. Where there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of money. That's where the tre that's where the like hidden it. treasure is. Wherever the noise yeah. is, mm -hmm. so so on the trading floors, everybody would be always be attracted to noise. And obviously, noise. You know, you can you can say noise is highly correlated to volume. Noise is highly correlated to volatility. I mean, there's all these. You you can make all these reasonably um, accurate assumptions about noise. And um, it was just our version of being able to 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 you know hear or see something. And I think when we got to be retail traders and screen based traders, which has been now for the last you know 22, 23 years. Um, you know, a lot of things change for us and we understand why people need something visual to look at. And we understand that, like when we built Tasty in 2017, we started to build technology where we were trying to wean people off like of charts onto using quantitative analysis to make decisions. You know, it, it's been a big process for us. We didn't try to do something because we said this is wrong because we believe charts are really good for engagement and they're really good to give people certain levels of confidence, things like that. But we wanted to give people real numbers like like the the missing the variables that are input into a Black Scholes model, which essentially deliver expected move and mm -hmm. volatility, essentially tell you what expected move is, you know, in, in a in in a with reasonable accuracy, 70%. Mm -hmm. So that became really important to us because we were giving somebody real numbers and we we focused on that, but we still offer everything, you know, yeah. but that's to answer your question, Justin, that's where, that's how we got to where we are today. It was mm -hmm. more of like, Hey, this is the way we always thought things were done. Right. And, well, and did you, did you want to go more using the numbers of, to try to help people with their emotions? Were you seeing that with your, some of your, the, the customers and stuff like that getting so emotional? Cause I mean, that's the tendency we, we've seen. Right? It's not, it's not as much about emotion as we're trying to get customers to think faster. Like we believe, okay. Okay. we believe that success is a byproduct of brain processing speed and quick decision-making. Like you will never, anytime you run into a, like um, a super successful, ultra successful person, the one thing you're going to notice in a conversation with them is they make decisions almost instantaneously. And when you see really good traders, you'll see that the mechanics that are that stand out the most to me are is quick decision making. And we mm -hmm. tried to get people out of it. it wasn't so much the charts themselves. It was more of we wanted people to have a set of mechanics in their head. So like if you said, hey, I want to buy, you know, let's say you said I want to buy IBM for whatever reason. And you would have a set of mechanics in your head that would say, okay, well, if I want to buy IBM, I know I can either buy the stock, sell a call. I'll sell the 30 Delta call. I'll sell the 35 Delta put. There's all these different things you can do in your head mechanically. So you don't even need to look at anything else. That's all we're trying to do is speed up the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So, um, so rather than technical, rather than fundamental, would you say it's just mechanical? 
to, to, yeah. to, to give your own little all? <laughs> well, I'm going to, I don't, I, I can't speak for, for how you guys think, but I'm an efficient market theorist. Okay. So what, what that essentially means is that I look at the markets and if something is trading for a certain price, I feel like that's where it's supposed to be trading. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't try to say, hey, this thing is mispriced because if something's trading for $10, XYZ is trading for $10. I don't try to think XYZ is worth 20 and it's trading for 10. I know XYZ is worth 10. So I'm not trying to guess that the market is mispriced. I'm not trying to say the market's mispricing something, but I can have an opinion about that stock thinking the XYZ is going to go higher than 10. And then I use a certain group of strategies based on implied volatility, you know, of where I, of how to play that particular underlying. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit because you mentioned the expected move. And uh, for us, that becomes really important as we come into earnings season here. Sure. Uh, you know, er earnings, uh, you, you always want to kind of have an idea of that expected move. And as you mentioned, the options market is just great at kind of giving you a, a good sense of that, that move. Doesn't tell you direction, just tells you, hey, this is the move. It could go either up or down. So, um, but you know, what we've certainly seen, you know, especially since Regulation FD came out and, you know, everyone has their quiet period. It's not as much of that nod, wink, wink. Here's what the earnings are going to be. Okay. Everyone's kind of getting this information, having to process, okay, what, what should this be valued at now? <laughs> and so you see all that volatility that happens after, after earnings. So what is, what is your approach, you know, because you use well, expected move so much and this earnings announcement can really make, make for some big moves either way. Sure. And and you're going to have your a certain percentage of those big moves, whether it's usually around 5%, which is the two standard deviation. And usually there's th some three and four standard deviations, which is the 1%. Um, but generally speaking, expected move is the most accurate statistic in all of finance. I mean, expected move is simply implied volatility. And as long as the underlying, as long as X, whatever the underlying you pick, so if you pick Microsoft, if you pick Apple, if you pick Google, if you pick Amazon, whatever it is, those are highly liquid underlyings that trade, you know, 10, 20, 30, 50 million shares of stock a day. Their derivatives markets are basically one, two or three pennies wide. The expected right. move is the most accurate number we have in all of finance. And the expected move on a short term basis, because of all the short term options now, is 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 the best thing that again, the best the best measure of what to expect. It's right about 70% of the time. That's that. It's just, and that 70%, by the way, is really 68 and change. It's a perfect distribution curve, what we, what we refer to. <laughs> uh -huh. so, so it's not like I'm not just throwing out a number of 70%, but like the expected move in Tesla today was, was $20. And the right. actual move, it looks like, was basically nothing. The expected Which move in, amazing, yeah. in, um, in Netflix, Netflix. Um, uh, the expected move in Netflix was about $40. And the actual move looks like it was, well, so far, it looks like it's about, you know, whatever, $20. Um, the point I'm making is a lot of times, you know, the expected move, it gives you an area of expectation so you can set up your strategy. The expected mm -hmm. move is where it's basically just a great spot to give yourself, like, like, let's just say you bought, let's say you bought Tesla, just as an example, you bought 100 shares of Tesla and the earnings were coming out because you were bullish. And you wanted to know, where should I place my sell order? Mm -hmm. You place it at the expected move on the upside, which would have been $20 higher. Now, it didn't; it probably didn't get there, but that's where you would place your move because that's the, that's the optimal place given all the statistics that are available. If you were bearish on it, you were short the stock, you'd try to buy it in $20 lower. That's mm -hmm. all. It just gives you an area for setting up things. Like if you were an option trader, maybe you set up a strangle. Twenty dollars higher, twenty dollars lower, or maybe you go two times the expected move, go forty dollars higher, forty dollars lower. But at least it gives you context, so you kind of know what your probability of success is going to be. Mm -hmm. And so, what kind of strategies do you use, um, you know, during earnings season? Uh, do you find that to be ripe for opportunity, or is um, is it a little bit tougher to play? Uh, I mean, it's, earnings, especially like last last yeah. earnings season, it seemed like it was very hit or miss. Like they were either up a lot or down a lot. Earnings have the least amount of edge of okay. any trade you can make, the least amount. Okay. So if you go out to a longer duration, you have a lot more potential edge because there's a lot of things you can do. You can adjust the trade. You can you can tweak it. You can make different adjustments along the way. It, with earnings, it's basically a binary event. Yeah. Like it's an overnight event and there's very little you can do. And so with earnings, statistically, you have the least amount of edge. They're essentially a pure theoretical play. So if you have something with a 50% probability of profit, 
it's 50%. If you have something with a 72% probability profit, it's 72%. But if you did something with, let's say, 40 days to go with a 72% probability profit, it'd be closer to 80. Mm -hmm. So you have edge if you go out longer. It's just, it's just a function of time. Duration gives you time to do things. Overnight binary plays, and it might not be earnings. It might be a Fed number. It might be, um, right. and it might be an economic number. All mm -hmm. of those, all of those binary events have the least amount of edge, but people love trading them because it's instant gratification. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now, Tom, you, you have a you have a really interesting perspective, not only from the retail side, but also from being part of a public company, running a public company. Sure. Talk about. How, how, you know, from that perspective on, you know, how the business was going and how the market would react to sometimes, which would be completely off to what the numbers, your fundamental numbers were actually saying or how the business was actually doing. Well, the funny thing is back when we owned Thinkorswim and we were public, we would have, you know, obviously quarterly earnings like everybody else. We were a NASDAQ listed stock and we would, you know, I mean, obviously we knew what our numbers were, but we had no idea how the street would react. Right. So I, I, I remember one earnings report we did, and, and this goes back, I, I think it was like 2008 in the middle of the meltdown. And I remember we were, we were putting out our numbers um, at 7 a.m. in the morning on like a Friday morning. And Thursday was like all hell broke loose. It was like, it was the, you remember the financial stocks at the end of yeah. 2008, they were oh, all, yeah. they were all yeah. just blowing up. Well, the financial stocks, like after the close on Thursday, we're all down big. The futures opened down 50 handles. And remember, back then, 50 handles was on a percentage basis was like almost four or five percent. And then the worst feeling in the world is going, we're looking at each other going, oh, my God, we have great numbers. And we're going to put our earnings out tomorrow morning with every financial stock down between five and 10 percent. Oh like, how God. can we win? You're right. So, you know, those are the kind of things as a as a CEO and some, you know, you're like, man, if I could just hold off for another three months, I'd love to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, you, so you put out great numbers and then the market, you know, still takes you down a point or two. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I can tell you that probably wouldn't have gone well if you had said, oh, can we delay our numbers? Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> then no, no, you'd no. have been down 20 percent. But, but so, so sometimes things are outside of your control. Yeah. Other mm -hmm. times, you know. We we once we had an earnings where we thought okay we were like we didn't even know how our stock was going to react after earnings and we're all sitting around and, and you know it was a bunch of my friends you know we, we all ran the company and so we were sitting around we were making like twenty dollar bets on whether or not you know we're going to open up or down you know one guy took down one guy took up and I'm like you know our, our numbers aren't that good but we we have a really good story to tell and you know and so and then and then that was our biggest up opening you know after wow. the numbers came out so like you just you you really don't know like like people say oh the like if you have a really bad number and you miss you know your stock's going to get killed mm -hmm. and if you have a really great number that nobody's expecting you know your stock's going to go higher but from i would say 80% of the time CEOs when they go to do their earnings reports really don't know and a lot of times the market you'll see like the market will uptick a little like like today in net in Netflix you know it they they ticked it up a couple of ticks right at first and they then it was only down like 1 or 2 dollars and then it dropped 20 dollars about 20 minutes later, like you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a really good point. Um, now, because you were, you know, you had created Thinkorswim and you did bring it public, um, you know, is, is there any kind of insight that you have on the IPO market? Like, I mean, things went a little crazy in 2020 and especially in 2021. And then the IPO market just dried up. Um, well, you know, it's funny. It's it's a good question because I, I will tell you the story um, because we were um, Tasty was bought by IG Group, which is a publicly traded company in mm -hmm. London. They're they're on the FTSE FTSE 250 or whatever. Um, and but we had five offers for for Tasty in 2021. It's been mm -hmm. two years. Yeah. 2021, I guess. And um, or the end of 2020, whatever it was. But we had five offers. And uh, um, three of them were SPACs and two of them were, you know, were international companies. And so the SPACs were, were almost $500 million higher. I remember oh we, sold the, yep. we sold the company for $1.1 billion, uh -huh. but, but we got offers up to $1.75 billion wow. and in a SPAC. Now, at the time, none of these SPACs had, had collapsed yet. So right. yep. as a yep. CEO... And as, as, as partners, we had, you know, there was a couple of us were partners, but I was a CEO as I'm sitting there, I'm going, um, 
you know, we're having these discussions and we're, we're talking to each other. And I remember Christy Ross was my co-CEO and Christy and I were talking to each other and we're like, okay, this group's willing to pay 1.75 billion for us. And we don't think we're worth it. Like, we thought, <laughs> like we're like, that's too much. I mean, yeah. we obviously you want to say, you know, yeah, we're going to be worth it. But at the time you're like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, but then the lowest, SPAC bid we have was like 1.35 billion. And we're like, none of these, like something's wrong. Like, yeah. you know, we're traders. We know. And we're like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint investors. Mm -hmm. We thought we were worth a little over a billion dollars. And that was what we ended up doing the deal for with a with a company that you know had a couple billion dollar valuation to start with. And they made a great trade because Tasty is a great company. But at the time, like that's what we were facing. Like that, I hope that answers your question. Cause because yeah. we we were like looking at this. You're sitting there on the one hand, you're like, hey, these guys are willing to give us 1.75 billion. But I think if they did, we would be, you know, really underwater right now. Right. Because I don't know if we could have held that valuation based on what all these other SPACs have done. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But but doing the deal we did, I think now the company is worth significantly more than we sold it for because it's a really good company. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it looks like you're really trying to, you know, get the, get that understanding of value, even though you're not a fundamental investor, you certainly had, you know, the, the story behind but your it, own it's company. A, it's, <laughs> it's a freaky thing to do because you got to go back to your shareholders and you got to yeah. say, Hey, you know, this is what we were offered <laughs> and we didn't take the highest. We, we took the, you know, basically the lowest because we the just one that made sense <laughs> because it well, made how was sense the reaction to that? How, how was the reaction to that? When, when you, I mean, the, you know, I, I think everybody understood. And I think in hindsight, we did the right thing. Yeah. But, um, and I think a lot of people that did these crazy SPAC deals, you know, I mean, they're never going to get under. I mean, I've looked at so many deals where where I looked at them, they were $10, $11, whatever they were, $9, 10 $11. These stocks are 20 cents now doing reverse right. splits, trying to get back to a dollar so they could even, you know, find somebody that, you know, there's so many stocks that are trading in the pennies. And, mm -hmm. you know, Fortunately for us, we actually had revenue. We were profitable. We had I, we would have been a successful SPAC. I just don't know if we could have met that price at the time. Yeah. Well, when we come back, we're going to take a little break here. And when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the earnings movers today. Uh, you know, look at a few stocks, but also kind of talk about some of those uh, durations that you need to be paying attention to to get the most success out of your trades. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, trader. With inflation, interest rates, and the recent banking crisis, are you nervous about what's coming in the stock market? If you're ready to take control of your trading and forecast trends instead of reacting to them, then Vantage Point's artificial intelligence is for you. Did you know Vantage Point's AI predicted the trends of all the collapsing banks weeks in advance? Visit www.freestockcoaching.com to learn how you can predict trends with up to 87.4% proven accuracy. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com. That's www.freestockcoaching.com. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with my weekly well, co-host, weekly special guest. Yes, uh, definitely guest. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Definitely guest. But uh, yeah, I used to call him the Heather Locklear, you know, the, the, the special <laughs> guest star, just like on Melrose Place. Uh, he has the Heather Locklear look. Um, but <laughs> Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors, uh, uh, pro portfolio manager and analyst over there. And then, of course, our guest, our really special guest this week is Tom Sosnoff, uh, the CEO and founder of Tasty Live, a serial entrepreneur and, uh, you know, all around great guy, too. So, uh, Tom, let's get into some of the stocks that you've been trading lately. And we, we kind of talked a little bit about Tesla, talked about Netflix um, and, you know, the, the fact that it's really difficult to get, um, you know, a, a good a good edge on these earnings plays, you know, if you're doing a short duration. So maybe before we get into that discussion, can you tell me a little bit what what is your typical duration when you're playing these stocks? Um, are you you know, are you buying how far out of the money uh, or uh, not how far out of the money, how far out of uh, expirations for your options? Um, you know, you could talk about how far out of the money or in the yeah, money. No, no, my, my, our, we've, we've found that the optimal duration for, for option traders. Now, this is not stock traders, but mm -hmm. the optimal duration for option traders, because of the way the option decay curves work and the pricing models is about 45 days. Mm -hmm. So the optimal duration is about 45 days and we like to manage it about 21 days. 
So there's a, there's a perfect duration in the decay curve. And that's where, you know, tasty kind of that, that's our methodology mm -hmm. for stock trading. It's different stocks. I will hold in some cases, you know, for, I mean, I've held stocks for years. I've held stocks for, you know, less than an hour. Um, I'm really all over the place when it comes to stocks. Uh, I don't trade that many just pure stocks, but, but I do, you know, do trade. I do have a stock portfolio, a kind mm -hmm. of like a core portfolio right. and, um, and futures trades, I'm kind of all over the place as well. I mean, I will trade some stuff that I'll hold for, you know, 20, 30 days or maybe even one or two cycles. And then mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, for less than 15 minutes, depending on what happens. And, and how far out are you typically going on your futures? Uh, do you have a different duration options. there? Futures options are about 45 days, the same as equity okay. options, because the models are exactly the same. Like the mm -hmm. pricing models, the decay curves, everything is exactly the same. Option traders, people that use options should focus on the 45 day, that 45 day duration. It is the perfect duration for um, either for buying or selling. It doesn't really matter. It's the perfect duration in the decay curve where you have the the greatest potential daily P&L with the least amount of risk. OK. Mm -hmm. And, and that's interesting that you say both on the on the buy and the sell side, because yeah. I would think, you know, on the sell side, I get it. You know, the decay, you yeah. know, you, you really get into, you know, things in your favor. But uh, tell me about the buy side. You know, I, I would have thought well, you, know, you would want to go far further out. The buy side is a little more challenging. And obviously, if you want to go a little further out of the buy side, you can because it slows down the decay a little bit. Right. But, but then you also make less money. Yeah. So you, you kind of want to be, you know, somewhere like like when we're buy, we don't buy a lot of naked options. I know that sounds weird, but we do a lot of spreads. And mm -hmm. so, and when you're doing that, you know, when you're doing a lot of option spreads, either from the long side, like long debit spreads or short credit spreads, you're, they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're really just, they're kind of the same type of trade. Yeah. So we tend to do them in that same cycle. And the reason for that is the reason that same durational cycle. And the reason for that is, is it keeps us very mechanical and very organized. Mm -hmm. like we don't have stuff all over the place. It's hard to right. manage hundreds That's of positions. Right. So that way it keeps us organized. Mm -hmm. so, so talk a little bit about uh, your approach to some, some, some of these earnings plays. So Tesla, you know, everyone's, everyone's waiting to see what happens with Tesla. Everyone's waiting to see what happens with Netflix. Um, do you, do you approach that with a, with a spread so that you have that kind of defined risk or um, what's, what's your approach there? And again, you're going a little bit further out 45 days, not the immediate. So, you can do a little bit of something, a little bit of adjusting, mm -hmm. but what, what, what's, what's your so, normal strategy? I played I played both Tesla and Netflix. Um, I played them small because those have both been difficult earnings plays. Last cycle, they were both really difficult earnings plays. Mm -hmm. But this time I played them small. I prefer um, to do undefined risk because I undefined risk lets you move your probability of success further out. So I did short strangles in both of them about two and three times the expected move. So it was very high probability trade. It'll work out fine. But, you know, it's the kind of trade where you you um, risk a lot to make a little. Right. Um, so, but both trades I made had about an 87, 88% probability profit. So I was pretty far out there, you know, delta wise. And um, I mean, obviously now it's going to work because both trades, both stocks are inside the expected move. But, um, um but I didn't know that, you know, prior. So um, stayed small, undefined risk, short strangles out about the 10, 12, 13 deltas. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So just, just real quickly, because we we do have an audience mostly of stock traders. Uh, could you just real quickly uh, do, do, do the short strangle and what the you know, how you set that up and and, and where you choose your strikes? I did short call, short put mm -hmm. um, two times the expected move in. Netflix, like I said, it was forty dollars, so I went eighty dollars away, and three times the expected move in Tesla. Expected move was twenty. I went sixty. Okay. So, and I did August, which has about thirty days to expiration. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so they should be, you know, nice winners tomorrow. That's all. It was just a, it was just a very small trade. Nothing, nothing major. You know, last cycle we got hurt pretty bad in in Netflix, so mm -hmm. I was a little gun shy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and, and that's and that, that's the thing, you know, so uh, yeah. again, with with a strangle, it's 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 really yeah. about either staying in a range or going yeah. outside of that range, depending on yeah. if you're doing a shorter. It's, it's typical trial. trading when you're right. You're a freaking genius and you go, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and you kind of hurt yourself, patting yourself on the back. And when you're wrong, you just get really mad. Right. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. Well, and, and again, 
you, you already mentioned this, there's a, a, a lot of the probabilistic trading. You're doing these very high probability trades, you know, 80%. Um, but as you, as you said, look, when you're wrong, sometimes, you know, one wrong trade can wipe out the gains from a lot of right trades. So how do you kind of manage that? That yeah. is the most challenging thing about being uh, short premium and about doing trades that have, you know, an extremely high probability of success is that you are, you know, some people say, hey, you know, you're you're picking up nickels in front of a steamroller type right. thing, but other people, right. you know, the, re the reality is that you're just, you know, um, the, the reality is that that you're just playing the game and I think if you stay small enough, the, you know, I, I just like, I like to be right. And I like, you know, the hard part for me about. Don't we all? <laughs> no, but the hard part about going the other way is I don't like, I don't like one winner to try to make up for 10 losers. Oh yeah. I yeah. much prefer, I much prefer 10 winners and try to control the one or two losers. Yeah. Like it's just, it's just a mentality. The yeah. numbers it, it, it's not exactly a zero sub game, but the numbers will come out somewhat similar. Um, you know, and, and listen, I do take directional risk. I mean, I will buy stocks. I just won't buy like Tesla or Netflix into earnings, you know, either, you know, buy them or sell them. I just don't like that risk. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So Tom, um, do you close out those positions tomorrow or how long? Oh, yeah. You let them out? Okay. Yeah. I'll be out before you guys wake up. <laughs> We're up pretty early, man. <laughs> oh, you're on the you're on the West Coast. We'll be out, yeah. you know. You'll be, you'll well, be, well, we're, we're on the West Coast, but we have East Coast hours. So, yeah, yeah I, I know. I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll we, hear, we don't have much. We'll hear the there. dings go off at about um, at about six thirty your time. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll cover we'll those. But I will I will consider doing. Um, there's a couple of post earnings trades that I will consider doing tomorrow. Okay. Um, the one thing I like about like Tesla and Netflix is. They're highly liquid. I mean, the whole world, yes. yeah. Tesla will trade like water tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So, so I think, and so will Netflix. So, so you can do whatever you want post earnings, and you know, I will try some post earnings trades. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever? I mean, options. You you have to wait for you have to wait for six thirty Pacific time, nine thirty uh, Eastern time. Um, when you're seeing something in the after hours market, do you ever play around in the after hours market in in very liquid names? To just kind of say, okay, wow, I went the wrong way. Um, um, do I do I need to kind of do something here to protect myself from that open? So you're you're talking about after hour stock and yeah, after hour stock, right? Yes. Yeah, the answer is um, we. I will occasionally, but I don't very often. I much so, but remember, I I do trade a lot of futures, so I will trade all you know futures trade twenty four five. Yeah, and so do so do most futures options. Mm -hmm. at least the liquid ones. So, so I will trade futures at day and night, but I, I rarely trade stocks after hours. Um, only if I'm adjusting my position or only if I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. like if I did like last cycle, I, I think, I, I don't remember exactly what stock it was. It might've been Nvidia after they came out with earnings and they blew, they blew out to the upside yeah. and I was short some calls. So I had to buy some stock at prices that I really didn't want to buy stock at in yeah. hindsight. In hindsight, it turned out to be a good buy because I think I right. paid like 380. I think the stock closed at 320 and I paid 380, you know, to buy some stock just to protect myself the next morning. And I hated that buy because I was locking in losers. Yeah. But I did it just out of, you know, just to protect my position. Yeah, Self-preservation. Well, did yeah, you hold those? Did you did you did you hold those or, or you, you were just completely or did you flip it and go go long? Uh, no, 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 no. There's no such thing. No <laughs> trader, no trader in the history of traders has ever has ever done, bought stock after hours to defend a bad trade and actually turned it into a winner. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really good point. Usually I'm licking this, my wounds at that point. I've been doing this for, for 40 years. 99% of the time I try to make that late hour adjustment. I wish I never made it. Right, um, right. Exactly. But it lets you sleep better. But no, you know, it, it, it's no, it's it's so damn. Remember also in after hours, you're you're up against a lot of sharks. There's not, yeah. there's not a lot of public traders left. No. So so it's a very different marketplace. I just be careful. I, I don't love when retail investors trade after hours. Mm -hmm. Now you talked in the first segment about kind of the the non correlation and uh, another earnings uh, play that was out there. Not not many people are talking about, but uh, certainly we've been you know looking at gold recently and mm -hmm. Newmont Mining uh, ticker symbol NEM. This this was also uh, dealing with earnings. So with 
something that's again very different from Tesla and Netflix. Yeah. Uh, do you treat that differently? Do you have different strategies uh, for uh, that, or I, do you use the same strategy and just uh, kind of? You, you could use the same strategy. I decided in, I did trade NEM on the close today, um, on the on the, you know on on before earnings, and I sold some. Um, what's this? I I think I sold the forty two and a half puts. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not sure where the stock closed exactly, but 45, um, 45, 45. Yeah. So typically for me would be to go one strike out of the money on the put side, um, because this is a stock that really hasn't rallied much. And so I was, I wasn't really concerned about the upside that much, but I didn't really want to sell calls. So I just sold some 42 and a half puts. And, and if the stock goes down tomorrow, you know, and I, and I get put the stock fine. And if not, I will, you know, adjust the trade tomorrow. If stock goes up, I'll just take profits. But that's all I did in there. So, so to answer the question, Justin, I did something different in NEM. Mm-hmm. I just sold some out of the money puts. Mm-hmm. Now, um, maybe because again, you're you're going short a lot of times. You're selling premium and everything yeah. like that. Um, are there ever cases? What, what do you what do you do with the assignment risk? Uh, so, no, there's there's no assignment risk because I I did August puts. Still, I'll okay. be out tomorrow. Okay. Now, assignment risk is not something that bothers option traders at all. Um, it bothers it bothers people like that that you know that that have read stories or they 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 think there's assignment risk is really pretty non-existent. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the only people that you have to worry about assignment risk are people that trade um, zero DTS yeah, and you're yeah. trading like spiders or something or cues, and you have to worry about assignment risk. But not um, you know not not if you're doing like 30 days out right now. There's mm-hmm. no you know an earnings. Mm-hmm. You know, Tom, actually, let's talk about zero DTEs because sure. that is a recent phenomenon. What are your thoughts about it and how do you think it's affected the market? Well, OK, so I'm going to tell you a little story here because this goes back. This is a little this is a little bit of my history. OK. So, and so when I first started trading, we only had options every three months. Right. Quarterly. So they're, they're mm-hmm. quarterly. So that's all you had for expiration. And then they went to monthlies like, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, 10, 15 years later. Mm-hmm. And broaden so, out the number that were available, too, which yeah, was nice. Yeah. So in 2005, we owned Thinkorswim and, mm-hmm. and customers were, you know, they wanted to trade. They want, they want more speculative, things like that. So I went to the SIBO and I said, I have an idea to launch daily and weekly options. There's no daily or weekly options. Right. And the SIBO, we sat down with the new product committee and they said, okay, we like the idea, but A, we own the idea. Oh, wow. even though even though you came to us we have the idea <laughs> yeah. and and we will try it in the spx because mm-hmm. you know because i i promised them that we would you know we we had retail customers that we would introduce it to and you need retail customers to, to launch a new product mm-hmm. so they said okay we'll launch weekly options as long as you introduce them to your customers and we'll see how it goes in the spx only so they said what should we call these so i said I had a whole proposal and I wanted to call them quickies because so, <laughs> so, I thought it would be a great marketing tool. It's a great marketing, it is. They, they loved it. And then they go, we just got to check with our attorneys. <laughs> oh, oh, that's the kiss go. of death right Enough there. <laughs> uh-huh. So they came back the next day. They said, Tom, we're going to launch weeklies. We can't call them quickies, but we're going to call them weeklies. You will get paid nothing for this, and you, will, and you guys will get nothing. But we're going to at least do it. And but even though you wanted dailies, we can't get there right now. It might take us a couple of years or whatever, a decade, but wow. we, we can't do dailies. But that was how the whole thing started back That's in amazing. it was two thousand five, two thousand six, and that was the, the we started kind of the whole thing with weekly options. Never in a million years. Did I think they would turn into 25 or 35 percent of all the option volume from just that crazy idea we had? But that's mm-hmm. that's what it went from. But they never wow. called them quickies, so we never got the full credit for it. <laughs> well, well, you know what? We might we might start just uh, calling it that internally. But the, you know? the whole zero DT thing, um, you know, everybody was freaking out at first. You know, they thought it was going to cradle as additional volatility, and yeah. they thought it was going to be bad for business. You know, all this kind of stuff. It's actually been really good to get people introduced to the markets. There's no edge in them. That's the problem. Like there's, mm-hmm. there's, you, you, you're, you're not, you, there's no theoretical edge. There's no trading edge, you know? So, so it's not great for customers in the sense of, wow, you got this product you can, you can go kill it on, but mm-hmm. if you want to take a short-term shot long or short, whatever it is, and you want to do something with instant gratification, it did open up a lot of people to, 
you know, to um, uh, cash settled indexes, to doing things on a very short term basis if they want to. We do a very small amount. Like personally, I do maybe one percent of my trades okay. in zero DTs. That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, with as many trades as you do, that's that's quite a bit, you know. So, um, one more question, kind of with the introducing of the, I'm just going to say quickies, uh, the the zero DTEs, uh, all of these different, um, you know, derivative products, option strategies, um, that are available now. Uh, a lot of people are using like the VIX, you know, as as kind of a hedging mechanism, you know. So, okay, look, I'm gonna I'm gonna own some of this, you know, options on the VIX to in case something bad happens, the the VIX will go up a lot and, you know, I'll make more on the options and kind of hedge my position. Do you think the, the VIX is as useful now? Um, is it, is, I mean, cause it's been so low yeah. for so long is some of these products kind of distorting that. So, so the VIX is a little harder to trade than, than you might think, but it is cheap right now, but the inverse correlation between the SPY or SPX and the VIX is, is negative 0.84. Right. So what that means is that it truly is an offsetting hedge to the SPX or the, you know, SPY or, or the ES, whatever you want, whatever you want to use as an S&P product. So the VIX really is a perfect hedge. Now, it's not my favorite product to trade as an offsetting hedge, but but it is very effective. Um, and it's, you know, it's plenty liquid, very effective. So if that's what if that's your hedge of choice. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely suitable. Mm -hmm. But do you think because of all of these other products that have come up that I, like John Nigerian was on the show, for for instance, and he was kind of saying, you know, he thinks the calculation has to be redone because it doesn't take in to account the zero TTEs. And, you know, that there, there's a little bit of a distortion there. And maybe that's artificially making it low. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts since you well, are in the he, thick of all of this. He he, John's right. I mean, the the and and John's a friend. We go back actually 40 years together. OK, <laughs> floor <laughs> trader days. <laughs> we basically started the exact same time in like 1981 or 1982. Um, and I just saw him. I was doing a I was doing a uh, I was speaking at an event in Puerto Rico and I just saw. Him oh, yep. I had dinner with him, so we caught up on a lot of stuff. But he, um, um, he's right. The VIX is basically is a measure of volatility thirty days out. Yeah. Um, but the VIX futures, okay, this is what's important. The VIX is a measure of volatility thirty days out, but the VIX futures are kind of a measure of spot VIX. So you can use VIX futures if you want, or you can use the micro VIX futures if you wanted to. But I don't think they're going to change the VIX calculation. But I, I do think that. If you're using zero DTE and you think you're getting the perfect zero DT hedge against the VIX, you're not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's right about that. But mm -hmm. again, your choices at that point, you know, when you, the nice thing about, about zero DT is you're not taking any overnight risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that th it eliminates all that risk. So sure. You're going to get much lower, you know, uh, zero DT volatility. Like the zero DT may be trading at 10 and the VIX may be trading at 14 volatility wise. Mm -hmm. And that is a big difference in option pricing. But, you know, again, I, I don't think they're going to change the, the calculation because I just I just don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. So, Tom, I got to say it, it was really, really great talking with you again. Absolutely. I just I loved all your content. Uh, I can't thank you enough for what you did for my options uh, knowledge. Uh, you know, I was I was dependent on a lot of your stuff uh, very early on, really got interested in the spreads because of you and everything like that. So thank you for all the you know content that you create, the education that you provide. Um, where can people kind of get more of this education from you? I mean, you have so much available. Uh, I know you're doing live shows now. Uh, what's what's the best way for them to kind of uh, follow along with what you're doing? So they can watch us any day. Um, Tastylive.com. Just mm -hmm. click on it. It's free network. It's the largest digital uh, digital financial network in the world. Just Tastylive.com. If you want to email me directly, just Tom at Tastylive. And if you want to see where our events are, like we're doing a huge event in Chicago this weekend um, at the House of Blues, but we have one coming up in LA in a couple of months. We have one in um, uh, we're in San Francisco, L.A., Denver, still Austin, Texas. We're all mm -hmm. over. We're like poop. We're everywhere. Okay. <laughs> but um, uh, you can come and just check us out at tastylive.com forward slash events. And you can awesome. see all the different events. They're all free. So you can come on out and uh, check it out and listen to us. And we do we do courses on everything. And like I said, everything we do is free. Our content's free. Our, our archives are free. And our mm -hmm. events are free. So um, it's all just content marketing for us. So um, 
We love it. And thank you so much for having me today. This was awesome. Yeah, I, I, no, I, I come back anytime you want. <laughs> okay, and I gotta no, say no. the fact that uh, the fact that it's all free uh, that, that was something that was definitely in my price range uh, when I was doing all that. So <laughs> yeah, so thank yeah. you, thank you for that. If you don't like it, we'll give you a free wolf uh, full <laughs> refund. <laughs> full there refund. You go. <laughs> and, and and just to kind of close it out, um, maybe just end end with your your favorite strategy. You know, again, earning season coming up. You kind of said strangles. Uh, I'm, is I'm a lot pretty of time much. I'm a premium seller, so I think that if um, the majority of my strategies are strangles but i'm op i'm i'm i am truly indifferent to product and strategy mm -hmm. so so i don't have like you know i'm not tied to anything but i'd say if you had to pick one it'd probably be a strangle and and for you a lot of times it's just the math has to work right yep. uh, it, it's all about the math uh yep. and again watching you live I, i'm i'm so impressed with how quickly you do make those decisions how quickly the math is so again if you want to see someone uh you know do it live and and make those decisions so quick uh, tom is you know you, you you can't learn from better so uh awesome thanks. thanks again tom for being on the show really appreciate thanks, it uh, appreciate yeah. it thanks and on the show next week, we're going to switch Toms. We're going to have Tom Dorsey. Uh, we actually got to talk with Tom Sosnoff a little bit about uh, them them meeting up. So Tom Dorsey is going to be back on the uh, on the show. Of course, he's a big technical guy. Uh, point and figure charts was his bread and butter. And you know, he brought so much to the, the conversation there. And it's always a pleasure to have Tom Dorsey on. So do tune in for that show next week. We'll be... Uh, Getting, it, getting this out to you as quickly as possible. We'll see how those earnings plays worked out for Tom Sosnoff. Uh, but thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Take care.